meeting is being recorded. Whoa! Welcome, students and teachers, to our post Super Bowl edition of the Constitution in American Life with the Friends of Publius. And what a Super Bowl it was! Throw out the halftime show with the dancing marshmallows, and it was one heck of an experience in American entertainment. In this episode, uh, episode four of our winter spring season, along with the band, Tim Moore, Chris Cavanaugh, Mike Williams, and myself, David Richmond, we are honored to have with us the fifth Beatle, Mr. Kevin Fox from Arcadia, California. Professor Fox has been involved with the We the People program going on close to 25 years. He was a teacher coach for close to two decades and indeed led a group of students to the national championship. I forget what year that was, uh, Mr. Fox, but uh, to the national championship. He has been a mentor and preceptor in the CCE professional development programs. He is considered one of the premier experts in unit one on the philosophy and history of America's constitutional system and is a Madison fellow joining the illustrious professors Moore and Kavanaugh as members of that elite group of scholars. They have a pledge pin and a secret handshake. Professor Fox, uh, welcome to our program. Thanks for uh, letting me crash this party. Looking forward to it. All righty. Uh, in today's program, we are going to address a question that has kept me up at night and in my search for truth presented me with a myriad of approaches one could make to address the principle of popular sovereignty and its role in shaping the American mind. I promise you a vibrant and energetic discussion tonight and I am well aware that there will be a myriad of per perspectives expressed throughout our discussion. Before we open up our discussion, I would like to read the quote from Alexander Hamilton uh, in Federalist Number 1 that provides the foundation for student and teacher exploration of the topic of popular sovereignty. Hamilton observed that ambition, avarice, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these, are apt to operate as well upon those who support as those who oppose the right side of a question. Does Hamilton's observation challenge the effective expression of popular sovereignty? So as has, our, uh, or as has uh, been our newly established tradition, I would like to throw this out to uh, the entire band here and have them kind of give us their first glance gut reaction when they saw this question. Uh, and I like doing this because usually <laughs> every time I look at new questions, state or national, my first glance gut reaction is, what the hell are they asking? Uh, uh, here I am. So uh, yeah, that's always my first uh, gut reaction. Uh, so Professor Williams, when you first saw this question, what was kind of your uh, gut, gut sense of what, uh, what it's about? Yeah, I thought, wow, this is a doozy. Uh, this is a, this is going to be a fun one for the students because I can see it going in different directions, right? I can see it being a 30,000 feet meta discussion about what does popular sovereignty mean? Um, but by the time you get down to the second bullet point, and it's kind of asking an institutional question about responsiveness. So, um, I mean, it's a challenging question, as it should be. Um, and I, I would expect that students, the teams, could pick numerous ways to come at this um, and all be equally persuasive. But it is, it does allow for a lot of room for interpretation of teams to answer it. Professor Kavanaugh. Um, what, what Mike said, uh, I would agree with for sure. But I would add, um, kind of like when we talked about um, Plato slash Socrates, and his definition of democracy, um, I would just to, uh, add on to what Michael said in terms of for the students, understand how that, that definition of popular sovereignty is going to change uh, through the course of history. So when we talk about popular sovereignty in 2023, and we're looking at a Hamilton quote from 1787, 88, um, there, the, the, how has that, that concept of popular sovereignty over the years changed? So be, be cognizant of that. That would be uh, something worthwhile to think of. Professor Moore. 
Yeah, um, I looked at it uh, right away, and I, I guess my thought is to, I mean, I'm always kind of shoehorning thinking things within the context of history, so uh, I kind of saw it as uh, one avenue to pursue would be whether ratification is actually an exercise in popular sovereignty or not. Um, so, but that that's kind of my uh, default uh, approach, you know, uh, put it in the context of history. But I think Mike's uh, Mike's points well taken that it could be a very conceptual um, and no and knowing Kevin uh, for, for for many years I would imagine uh, he might side with Mike on that that uh, maybe it, it it should be I, I don't know I'm, I'm anxious to hear what Kevin has to say uh, whether it's just a straight up theoretical philosophical question rather than a historical question so I I'm I'm uh, I'm excited to hear um, and banter about this yes. <laughs> Well, uh, Professor Fox, what's your first uh, gut reaction to this question? Well, first, Dave, I have to say that I'm, I'm, uh, I commend you for keeping a straight face when you referred to me as a preceptor. So your, your restraint there was, was noted. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, it's a doozy. That's a qu this question is, uh, it's ginormous, and I hope it is, because it, it really addresses, I think, one of, you know, one of the pillars of American constitutionalism, right, popular sovereignty as an idea on which you take like a Lockean, Jeffersonian, you know, when you establish a government, that's a moment of popular sovereignty. And then as Tim says, then when we move into that, actually making it real, to what extent was the ratification truly popular sovereign? Uh, and then as, as Chris says, absolutely, as we've evolved, because popular sovereignty can exist at the one time of establishment, but it's an ongoing exercise, right? Where, how do we express that today? And how have we expressed it across our history in many, many different narrations? So I think it's it's a question that's uh, kind of wide open. Uh, and I think it's going to be fun for kids to have to sort of grapple with that. Where do they come down to make this a workable uh, enterprise? And, uh, you know, I mean, just something that I considered as I looked at this is, is that I think we, we all would agree that in general, you know, textbooks, and I think, Kevin, you just referred to it, textbooks refer to popular sovereignty as a as a first principle or a founding principle, mm -hmm. uh, yet I I struggle struggled myself in all my teaching years uh, uh, with okay how real is that is this is this one of those mythologies uh, of American history and American constitutionalism oh yeah popular sovereignty but then you go out in the forest looking for it uh, and suddenly you're lost and surrounded by monsters so I'll stop sharing my my nightmares uh, with you so. It would be accurate to say, would it be accurate to say, well, I think it's accurate to say, and then you guys can disagree with me, that there, is, there can be both a philosophical, since this is unit one, kind of a still philosophical viewpoint of this and a historical viewpoint of this that could bring you to different conclusions. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Fox, is that, would that be acceptable to, to have? Oh, that absolutely. View? Okay. Oh, absolutely. Right. For sure. Yeah, and I think, like, right, so there's the ideal the historical development of this concept, right, with Hobbes a little bit and then Locke and Rousseau and then what Jefferson works through in, into the uh, declaration. And then the question is, really? Right? Really? Because, you know, you've got a, a structure in Article 7 of the Constitution for Ratification that's laid out and it's got kind of elements of popularish sovereignty, right? And then you've got the Article 5 amending process, which is, again, elements of popular sovereignty built within it, but it's not really. And then the practice day to day and the ongoing sort of reconsenting at every fixed election, to what extent are, are those exercises truly uh, expressions of popular sovereignty? And then what Hamilton's quote, I think, goes to, too, is when we're engaged in that exercise collectively as we the people, right? And uh, that there's some notion of civic virtuousness there, hopefully. And then you've got that, that counter side that you hear in, in numerous times in the Federalist Papers. Well, really, can we really trust people to to not to, to rise above their own selfishness uh, and their own sort of uh, parochial viewpoints? And how does that make the realization of the we collectively sort of trying to express our will? So it's going to be a tough well, one. Well, you know, many times throughout this uh, program, uh, I stick Mike Williams with the job of uh, of, of of definitions. Uh, and, and here, and, and this is kind of to all of you, if you can help me clarify a little bit. The, one of the other things I had troubles with 
is this notion of an effective expression of popular sovereignty. What in the H-E double toothpick does that mean? Effective expression, all right, of popular sovereignty. Uh, and again, I, Tim, Kevin, I don't know, you know, or who wants to start off. But can we give me something to grab onto of what th that part uh, of, of this question means? Who wants to jump on it first? Oh, uh, wasn't that to Mike to define it? It could be. <laughs> I didn't hear it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way you used to do it. So now you were changing it up. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah that, that, that was. <laughs> what, Professor, were you saying something? I, I'm sorry. Uh, there. Uh, Tim, go ahead. Do you have a thought about what uh, that means? Yeah, I do. Um, I think, you know, for better or worse, Jefferson sets us up from the get go on. Uh, on our dilemma is to your to your point directly our dilemma is really uh defining what this and how much uh how much popular sovereignty do you need at various points um kevin mentioned um you know the the do you need popular sovereignty in creating a system and then after that is popular sovereignty necessary after the system has been set up then it's all just like uh policy preferences and not a, an exercise of popular sovereignty per se so I, I think americans uh are are set up for an endless um discussion about uh how how popular how popular sovereignty are we uh and it, and i think the first the first two paragraphs of the declaration sets us up for that two plus century um discussion that's really i i think problematic because i don't i i don't um i don't think it's a it's a fixed definition uh because and even if it was there would be people not satisfied with that definition because they want a little more democracy and a little less aristocracy um you know that 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 pendulum i think goes back and forth in our history so i, I think jefferson sets us up for a um a cultural, political, philosophical discussion about how much how much democracy do you have to have a bottom up demos input into anything that you do? Well, being the the slow witted one here, it seems to me if you have effective expression of popular sovereignty, you could also have ineffective expression. <laughs> And so, well, uh, yeah, D didn't uh, Madison say that if every uh, every every Athenian was a Socrates, it'd still be a riot. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can have you can have all kinds of, you know, small D democratic input and it still would be a mobocracy. So, Professor Fox, uh, and you talked about, you know, kind of, you know, the philosophical uh, elements of this. Uh, and, uh, you know, Hobbesian, Lockean kind of view of the world, it seems to me that Hamilton is expressing a very strong and dark view of, of human nature. Do you agree with that observation? Yeah, and largely, I think many of the founders distrusted small d democracy, right? They, like Tim said, they feared the mob. Um, they experienced it. They saw what its what its potential negative potentials could be. So, yeah, I think I think the founding generation, writ large, was somewhat skeptical. Now, maybe the Federalists more so than the Anti-Federalists in their general viewpoint, but for sure there was a fear of selfishness and and lack of reason in decision making, whether it be establishing the government in this case with the ratification or later on in the regular electing processes and policy making. And then one other thing I want to add to your original comment was you know, federalism has sort of made this whole question of popular sovereignty even more complex because being in a state of Cal like California, where we have initiative, referendum, and recall, um, we've got mob, direct democracy writ large, and it's causing all kinds of problems uh, in, in how you govern the, the, the country's largest state um, with that kind of interference by special interest groups and, and groups that are like Hamilton feared way more interested in their own selfish outcomes than what would be potentially right for the general well. Well, so again, that begs the question about the sincerity of this gen the 18th century generation of constitution creators. There's the sincerity of their belief in popular sovereignty. If you have a very dark, almost Hobbesian view of human nature, 
And if it seems to me you imply that that is the general consensus view, how could you have any trust or belief in a government of the people, by the people, for the people, as implied by popular sovereignty? Well, that's a that's a Lincoln phrase, but uh, the uh, yeah, but it's a phrase. I would say American I would say this: Madison over and over uses the phrase the, a reliance upon the people. Uh, he's not, and what I would recommend for our consideration that that does not translate cleanly, in my estimation, to popular sovereignty. I mean, he often uses that phrase in in justifying, uh, you know, how the house. The house. Okay, it, so house this is, is good. A, this is you know because you have to have a system that ha is built upon the reliance of the people. Now that I'm not saying I, I'm I'm suggesting that doesn't equal popular sovereignty because Kevin's right. <laughs> They've taken a dim view and they put federalism in. They put bicameralism in. They put all kinds of checks on power. Uh, so they I think they do take a dim view, but they have to. The revolution sets up this notion of uh, a reliance upon the people. It, the, the declaration sets this up. Well, so we're back to, you know, my basic premise is that they're doing this, they're, they're snickering. You know, they're kind of laughing going, you know, let's throw out these phrases. That's kind of what you implied there about Madison. You know, well, let's call it popular sovereignty because, you know, the people will accept that. But in reality, they have fundamentally no belief or no trust in popular sovereignty. I no, Go ahead, I Mike. yeah, I don't agree with that. I mean, okay, for me, if, if I was going to break down what popular sovereignty meant meant back then, and I think kind of means now, it's just it's consent, right? It's some the people demonstrating some explicit or tacit consent to be governed, and I think what the founders are dealing with is in a world where that consent was filtered through a monarch that may or may not have some sort of connection to the heavens, which was where that consent came from. If you're gonna, if you're gonna put that consent in the people, whatever that is, it's not just a flippant, um, we're just saying this, it's, it's a whole new conception of like where the source of power is. And I think popular sovereignty for the founders is the source of the power is gonna be in the people. And then they set up the mechanisms of government around that to make sure that the people ruled themselves in a way that wouldn't lead to tyranny. That to me is like the two step, but it's, I mean, if you compare the, what the outcome of the American revolution to the French revolution, right? Mm -hmm. And the way popular sovereignty operates there, where they actually go back to a king-like figure, Napoleon, after going through the reign of terror, I think the, the founders, I think, were smart enough to see that that was, that was a road that this could go down. Once you, once you get rid of the king and that unity has gone, there, there's different paths that can be taken. And I think American history is one path. And I think French history, at least for the last 30 years after their revolution, shows a different path. So I don't think it's flippant. I think it's, I think it's a serious consideration of when you say that people are going to have the power to consent, what then how what's the next move after that right so is that is that kind of our model then for effective expressions of popular sovereignty the american revolutionary experience and the french revolution experience is that a simple model to provide mr cavanaugh what do you think about that yeah that's that's probably overly simple but i was thinking um of uh i appreciated tim going back to jefferson and the declaration and the idea of consent but you also take into consideration as well that, you know, this opening paragraphs where he's, you know, he's ripping off Locke um, and talking about this stuff. Um, it's also part of a, a PR job, perhaps, and the idea that this is why we're leaving. This is why, you know, we're, we're, we're declaring our independence is because we believe in this concept of popular sovereignty and it's not being met by the king. The king has violated the social contract. We have not consented to these laws. Therefore, we're out. And he doesn't say how they should have consented. Should they have consented by colony? Should they consented by some type of colonial uh, vote? So they don't really, really, he doesn't really address that, but he be, is able to throw these, the philosophical idea about consent in the first few paragraphs of the declaration. Um, and going to the idea of Hamilton, I was just listening to a, a podcast from a local uh, humanities scholar who actually is a Jefferson scholar, 
And his guest set uh, this past Sunday, I'll, I'll put a link in resources to the podcast. It's pretty good, especially in the first 10 minutes. His guest was a Hamilton scholar. And they talked about how their views on human nature, uh, you know, Jefferson was kind of like, oh, kind of rosy. And, and Hamilton was much more like the quote we have um, and really saw human nature for what it was. Um, and, and they both kind of agreed that maybe Hamilton was a much better uh, viewer of human nature in the long term, as, the, as was Jefferson sitting up in his little ivory tower in Monticello. So, Professor Moore, uh, the question, in, in my opinion, uh, the way I read it is as addressing the ratification process. And we've kind of, you know, uh, cleansed that out a little bit. I am wondering what options were discussed in Philadelphia regarding how ratification would proceed and to what extent, if any, is popular sovereignty reflected in those options? Yeah, um, I don't know, Mike, um, I actually put together a, a little, I don't know, it's not a chart or a graph, it's just like a little handout. Can I, do I have the ability to screen share, Mike, or not? I, um, I can give it to you right now if you don't. Um, I thought maybe you were going to like a oh, chart. Oh, there it is. I got a chart. it. You have like okay. a chart of tools? Is it no, 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 no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're never going to let me live that down, are you? Uh, at Philadelphia and or immediately after Philadelphia, these all of these options were discussed. Uh, now we know I'm mean, kept in reference to uh, Article Seven, and, and they chose to um, bypass state legislatures and go to conventions. Uh, so, so that's the one that they selected at Philadelphia. But all these others were talked about at the time. They could have opted just uh, the uh, the convention itself. Well, here's your constitution. Take it or leave it. By fiat. Um, the Philadelphia Convention to, to state conventions. Okay, we, we're familiar with that. They could have opted uh, Philadelphia Convention to the Congress. And let me, before I go any further, there's an argument to be made that there's some degree of popular sovereignty in each of these entities. Mm -hmm. Now, some of us might prefer, you know, if we, well, my popular sovereignty o meter uh, doesn't register real high on scenario three. You know, or we we could quibble about how much popular sovereignty do you have to have before it satisfies your. Uh, well, you know. if I can, if I can just choose one, um, I can I can see it in in the second and third one. But the first, fiat by Philadelphia Convention is that one that has some element in your opinion of popular sovereignty. Well, sure, because if the so, state, how? sure, the state sent the delegates. The, 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 the state legislature did. Yeah, so you're talking legislature. about you're talking about indirect indirect well sure i'm not oh, sure. you know i'm the, don't don't shoot the messenger here i'm just saying <laughs> no so for you there's not enough popular sovereignty in that scenario and that's fine all i'm saying these are the things that are on the table as to how they could have done it uh i mean we last week we talked a little bit about referendums uh, i mean <laughs> Philadelphia Convention to Congress, then to state legislatures, then a state referendum. I, that that would probably satisfy you, David, because there's a whole lot of popular sovereignty. And, you know, I mean, think about how much popular input there, there is in these. So so the uh, so when it comes to ratification, these kind of were the options available. Um, and they opted to go to state conventions now. And I think there's a critique to be made that, well, I'm not sure that satisfies this. Uh, if you have a high bar to determine what state sovereignty is, I'm not. I'm not sure um, any of these would actually satisfy a high a person that has a really high bar of popular uh, consent. Uh, but that the, these we can put this in the in the reference as well. But um, these were the options, and I think it demonstrates that the the folks discussing all this at the time were concerned about. We do have to have, as Man Madison's word, a reliance on the people. Now, how much? That's the issue. That's the debate. Well, and and you know, we you know, again, as I think we're all clear, there seems to be an ongoing theme amongst these national questions to deal with small d democracy and you know uh, 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 either in a critical or supportive way. Uh, I guess my frustration, you know, to all of you and to you, Tim, specifically, is, is you know, 
the contemporary acceptance of this notion of popular sovereignty, you know, having a, a broader role for all the people. It seems to me Hamilton's notion of popular sovereignty is, yeah, we want power in the hands of, of the people, but it's a certain select group of people. All right. It's 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 more of Mercy Otis Warren's concern about this, whether it's a natural aristocracy or whatever. And, and that's when we use this term popular sovereignty, it seems to reinforce what I consider somewhat of a myth here uh, uh, that indirect, yeah. indirect, indirect. And know. it's and it's ultimate disaster and nightmare is this sovereign citizen movement that we see going on in the country right now. I mean, you, you run popular sovereignty out there. Uh, to its nth degree, and it's absolute anarchy. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, Mike. I would, no, I would just say that to me, you don't. I hear your critique, David. I don't. I don't think you run into that if you just if the people consent to a system of government where it's going to be representative government. Government. There's going to be these indirect things. That's one level of consent. The other level is that you know the people are going to have the opportunity through federalism to have more direct say on very local matters. If, if, you, if you can see it that they've, we consented to that form of government, right? Then I don't think you get into the problem of like that they're um, tricking us. The problem is, is have I, did I, what did I do to consent to that form of government other than not leave the country, right? And is, is there some sort of ongoing mechanism that should be there that we all reconsent to the very constitution itself and the very frame of government. I'm not saying we should, I'm just saying that, that gets closer to what I, I think I hear your criticism being. Uh, Professor Fox, uh, thoughts about uh, uh, Mr. Moore's uh, models or list or <laughs> chart, uh, whatever. <laughs> no, I think that's a, that's a really great way to look at it. I think he's right in that every one of those options has some degree of quote unquote popular sovereignty. And I think that goes to the core of the question, effective popular sovereignty. Well, popular doesn't mean everybody, or, or it could in the minds of a few as, as Tim re refers to the, you know, the, the sovereign citizen movement today, but it's really about how much is enough, right? It's that Goldilocks moment of what's the right mixture um, and what's the right number. And then it's about general consent. Do the American people continue to have faith in the system that is operating, uh, that our founders and generations have given us, and do we continue to maintain that faith? Um, and that's the effective part. If, if people start losing faith and we start seeing um, people dropping out of the electoral process system in great numbers, we, we hope we see an uh, the opposite of that now, right? With more and more people engaged, where they're not blocked uh, at their state levels. But, you know, so that's really what it comes down to. It's like, what's the right sweet spot? Uh, to make this system continue to work. And then like the last bullet of the question asks is like, okay, what do we do when it stops? What happens when the system itself is no longer truly representing the general will of the people? Um, and some people make that argument today, right? It's been bought off by special interests. The system doesn't really serve the normal average American citizen. Uh, and there's some, some question. Well, let's get into that. Professor Kavanaugh, again, being the dim-witted one, when I read this, it seems that Hamilton is, uh, is, is expressing a nod towards affirming the presence of political parties. Uh, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's, it's factions in some uh, form uh, as, being, as being part of, obviously, our federal republic. Would it be accurate it, uh, to say that this is where we would find the principles of popular sovereignty in our system of government? That is, our expression, all right, of the popular will has this intermediary, you know, informal institution uh, called parties. And that's where we would see, uh, uh, again, the popular will expressed. Um, not originally, I don't think. I think this is, Hamilton is talking about, he will, and I, I think in uh, later Federalist Papers, he will use some of the same language that's in the quote when he's describing political parties, uh, you know, the, the, and and he goes on, I think, and in, in, if you look at Fed one uh, below that quote, he goes on to say this could be people in favor of the Constitution and people opposed to the Constitution. But later, I forget the Fed, uh, the Federalist paper number, but he 
describes political parties in some of the same ways. So yeah, it's, um, I don't think originally though, this is how popular sovereignty was necessarily expressed through parties. I think, you know, obviously we see Madison and Fed 10, you know, defining factions, which I'm sure most of the kids watching this will have Fed 10 out the ears, so to speak, in terms of uh, doing factions. Uh, but, but I think that you start to see then eventually in a more modern sense, um, people willing to give themselves over to the R or the D. You know, once they see the R or the D, their, 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 their mind is made up. And so they can express their will through that political party. But I want to add on something, too. And David, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support you back on your previous point. Um, this is back to my first comment about popular sovereignty. And that is, you know, much like, boy, much like, uh, um, uh, gosh, uh, Magna Carta. You know, the idea of these rights, well, we all know that these rights in Magna Carta were for a very select group. And when we start talking about the founding period, this idea of popular sovereignty was a for a very select group. And I'm going to channel my inner Mike Williams here and say, we don't really get to popular sovereignty until 1965. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, so understand for the students watching this, it is a it's a growing effect, and I saw Tim Tim wanted to jump in there for a second. Well, was, I wanted to ask Kevin uh, a question because uh, I know Dave when David's comments about uh, the general will. Uh, so I'd like to ask Kevin: Does Rousseau matter? Because uh, you, know, you mentioned Lobs and Hawk. Well, uh, Lobs. <laughs> hey, there's kids, there's a kids new don't try this at home or train professionals. <laughs> <laughs> there's a new t-shirt <laughs> yeah uh, so is i mean rousseau uses that concept the general will and, and um is that his version of popular sovereignty and is that why the founders he sent is my understanding essentially reject rousseau i would think so and, and part of rousseau's uh problem was he never he never Action, I actioned the idea of, of the general will. He didn't say, how are you going to get there? He right. just said it was just sort of this theoretical idea that would be really nice to get. And then he never articulated any specifics. So he couldn't about, solve the problem either. He couldn't solve the problem that he created, right? And so he left it to us to try to figure it out. <laughs> well, and, and I want to go... You know, and I want to go back again. I, I'm, I'm fixated here, Chris, on this notion of effective expression. If you're going to have an element of popular government... All right, you've got to have some, uh, you know, formal or informal kind of institutional methods to channel that expression. It, you know, again, it can't be this, you know, this sovereign individual, you know, movement kind of thing. So, you know, and, and again, those parties emerge. You say not early on, but they do emerge in the right. 1790s. Yeah, I mean, and it, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long. Uh, what did Tim, 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 I don't know uh, if Tim's they're, having they're, a seizure or or they're, <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> back in the 1760s. They're certainly yeah. in the 1770s. They're there. Right. But I'm saying post ratification, it doesn't take long for parties to form. Right. So I think he was apoplectic. I think that's the word we want to use. Um, yeah, and you know why I don't use that word uh uh there because I can't say the word uh uh uh, there. So, well, I, but, you know, but, but, yeah, but to... David, David, to your point, yes, he's he's referring to people, whether individuals or eventually parties, because again, he does this. I don't have to find that Fed number that he does this, but he's you know the the baneful affections of faction as well as party. Um, but yeah, but in in essence, parties be, parties serve a purpose. It, it helps to organize people by common ideas. So I think that you know. Um, and, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, that you know, people now is R or a D. I mean, people will not support any good proposition, perhaps from a, an opposing person, once they hear who that opposing person represents, which is frustrating because there may be good things there, but which is, I don't know, we get into this whole sense of tribalism or modernism with political parties, but there is a really good purpose of political parties because it does help express popular will. So, Dr. Williams, you know, you, you come to us uh, with a background in comparative politics. 
And I, you know, and, and as we've been dealing with this consistent theme of small d democracy, you know, from Socrates slash Plato uh, forward, uh, is, is America, in your opinion, ahead or behind the curve when it comes to a government grounded in this principle of popular sovereignty? And yes, my definition is a broader sense of that. That is, you know, having more people participate rather than less. I, I don't go to the extreme uh, uh, there, but, you know, uh, uh, or, you know and, and the use, and we can go back to, to our last session on initiatives and things like that, or, you know, popular referendums at the national level, are we, you know, I know I've said a lot of different things here, but, but are we ahead of the curve, behind the curve, kind of equal with all other nations in this expression of, of the popular will or the popular sovereignty? I think we're kind of, I, I mean, I think we're in the middle of the pack, okay? And I think that there's different ways you could think about measuring that, different ways you could think about it. You could think about, I think Kevin's already mentioned like voter turnout. We're kind of middle of the pack there, right? And then you could think about um, the number of political parties. And if, you're, if your argument is that more political par parties are providing for more channels of representation to actually mirror the number of views. I mean, no one can make an argument with a straight face saying that we just have two different views in this country, like Republican, Democrat, then we're kind of behind the curve there and that we effectively have two party system. Um, I think our federal system allows for more opportunity and more popular sovereignties <laughs> to be articulated. Um, so I think that I think we have an advantage there. Um, I did want to share and then another one to look at is just how satisfied are people with the current political system and we'll i'll put this in the show notes uh it's a pew poll from 2021 so it's a little outdated but you know 85 percent of americans in that poll said that this political system need significant reforms compared to in sweden it was only 34 percent um those satisfied with the way the democracy is working in the united states it was 41 percent and in sweden and i'm I'm giving Sweden because it, it was at the high mark, um, 79%. So there's different ways you can kind of slice this apple and kind of come up with your measurements. Um, so I, I think we're kind of middle of the pack, if not kind of near the bottom third. In these, I, I'm in, I'm intrigued by 2021 being an outdated piece of information. <laughs> You know, those of us in social science, uh, Professor Moore, we, we, we get data a lot. We call uh, you're a touche, touche. I'm sorry, Chris. I'm sorry, Chris. No, ahead, no, Chris. that's, that's, uh, that was good. Um, I wonder though, um, because I, I, I listened to the Michael uh, rattling off these statistics from that clearly outdated piece of information from 2021. Um, but it, it reminds me of people, you know, uh, responding to say education. The education needs reform. We we, we need some time. We need all massive overhaul of our education system. And, but if you ask them, what about your kid's teacher? Oh, well, we like Mr. Fox. He's really nice. Right. So you, if people from that 30,000 foot view, oh, we need to rework things. But then say, well, what do you, what about your representative? Uh, well, he's we like our guy. We just got to vote all the other guys out. Yeah. So I wonder, a I'm, a, I'm a little jaded by that. Well, see, I mean. Chris, I'll use one of the arguments you like to make on here. You know, you look at public opinion polls. What the percentage? Senate is crap? Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, this, this example gets to that. I mean, what percentage of Americans say that they want certain types of gun control or certain types of reforms? Yes. Then that's not happening. So It's called you know, gun safety measures, not gun control. I just want to make that clear, all right? Yeah. So I think it gets to that point. There can be some noise in there. You might think that you're member of Congress is okay, but I do think those those polls do tell us something about this frustration between what the people want, the people, sure. and what their government has given them. Right, I, agreed, agreed. But the, the, I think that pro my, my problem is, is always the people, <laughs> is the disconnect, right, between seeing, well, gee, how does my guy always vote on these issues that I don't see being, you know, being put forth in legislation? So yeah. there becomes that disconnect between um, the people that they send, whether it be to the state house or to Congress. Yeah. yeah. I had a question of Mike. Is there any case to be made that the number of bottom-up social movements 
in a culture is indicative of popular sovereignty. Because uh, I'm thinking about the cross fertilization of social movements across continents and across uh, countries. Is, is anybody, is there any information out there on that's an indicator of popular sovereignty? Because we have a lot of people that go out in the streets and holler. You know, I didn't, in doing some research for this question, I didn't come across that. And if anything, to me, Tim, it, it would cut the other way. I mean, hmm. If popular, if we're def, if we're saying popular sovereignty has something to do with consent, right? Right. And if if you see social movements of people going out in the streets and voicing their discontent, right, <laughs> right. I don't know. Maybe that's a measure to show the the frustration with the people saying we want our government to be representing these views and it's not, rather than something showing. Yeah, I think it could cut either way. So. Mike, I, I, you know, you, you put us in, in the middle, lower middle of the pack internationally of like, like minded or like structured uh, countries here. I, I'm curious about if we look at our written constitutional structure mm -hmm. all right, and the design of institutions and such, where would you point to in regards to our institutions? to provide evidence of popular sovereignty. Now, it seems to me this we've come up with a really broad, all right, notion of popular sovereignty. And, uh, but I'm just wondering, where would you point to to say, ah, here's popular sovereignty in the American system, you know, absent the preamble, starting with we yeah. the people, which I, I assume is supposed to be the greatest expression uh, there. Uh, but I am just wondering if you were gonna, you know, have an argument in the international arena and say, oh, no, our constitution has many expressions of popular sovereignty. Where would you point to? Um, I would say it's the election every two years of members of the House, and it's um, allowing for states to determine elections at the local level. I mean, I, I don't, you can't argue that our presidential elections represent popular sovereignty or judicial review or the Senate. But, well, yeah, you can if you have the broadest understanding. That is, the judiciary is there by the people's voice because we indirectly elect the president and we indirectly, well, now directly elect the Senate. They work together. to choose. So there is a shadow of popular sovereignty there. I mean, that's that's Marshall's argument in, uh, in Marbury. We're just enacting the will of the people and by... Uh, uh, striking down this law, but that's uh, I mean, it's all very argument. it's all so very indirect though. I mean, this is the whole dilemma, right? And so, are those are those enhancements of popular sovereignty? Or those are or is our system a bunch of barriers to it? Going back to the original question to Kevin about their view of human nature, their view of the common man, their fear of small d democracy. It seems that our constitution is a series of barriers. To you know, to tamp tamper down, you know, the the expressions of the popular will. I'll try to get through this with a straight face. Okay. Uh, I think when uh, administrative agencies have public comment, people can you know uh, people show up at the APA meetings and holler about wetlands reg regulations. Uh, aren't school boards uh, popular sovereignty? Aren't uh, <laughs> Aren't zoning commission hearings um, an exercise in, in some kind of localized popular sovereignty? So, yeah, so I but think in and, the federal Mike, system, uh, you know, has set that up. Right. Mike has said that. I think Kevin has said that. Sure, within the federal system, and those powers reserved by the states and their localities. I yeah, sure. I definitely see popular sovereignty there. Yeah. But then when we move to the national level. All right. And again, I know you said to me that I focus too much on the national level there. Yes, you do. But that, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> no, and, and, and you're right. Uh, to me, the, you know, the study of the Constitution is the study of the national government in many ways. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, there, but, uh, you know, so what about the national level, no. Tim? And this is to everybody. Mike, go ahead. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it's there, but I don't think that means that there's no popular sovereignty in the system. I mean, I think the federal system sets up these multiple places where popular sovereignty can be expressed. And we can argue whether those expressions are ones that we think are healthy, like at the local school board meeting, is that what popular sovereignty looks like? 
just like in the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854. Is that what popular sovereignty looks like? I mean, but there's an example of it. At the national level, I just don't see very many examples of it. And I think that's by design um, that we've talked about on this, our show many times about the reasons why that was done. Yeah, I think that the the paramount concern, right, in Philadelphia, among others, was stability. Um, and that's the effective part, right? It's like, how do you create a republic that has elements of democracy built into it and then let it go without having too much meddling as it goes along? Um, and then we have those frequent elections and fixed terms and all those those moments where we come back and re-consent. Um, and it's all about legitimacy, right? To what extent is the system legitimate to the American people? Uh, and that's a moving target for sure. Kavanaugh, you with uh, you with Professor Williams on that? That you're just not going to find it in the national constitution. I think I think you find elements of it. I think uh, K. Fox alluded to it in his opening statement about the ratification, uh, the uh, ratification of amendments, uh, Article Four, is Article One, excuse me, uh, Section Four about uh, elections. Um, so I think you see elements of it in there, but I think you also see um, the way the system has. And, and again, this is me saying probably more operator error than anything else. But, um, you know, you're talking about this indirect nature of electing the president and this indirect nature of uh, people getting on the Supreme Court. So what happens when you have a president that's elected by the Electoral College and not the popular sovereignty of the people who gets to nominate several people and put them on the court? will be confirmed by the Senate that, that does not represent the majority of people. So I, I also see elements that in our system as it plays out today that are very anti-democratic, very anti-popular sovereignty. I'd, I would just add to that the amendment process and the impeachment process. <laughs> They're not exactly expressing the will of the people in those moments, you know. Yeah, you can amend the Constitution with less than 50% of the population because of the shout out to the states in Article 5. So, Professor Fox, there's not a week that goes by that I don't come across uh, either a newspaper article or a journal article uh, in which members of the Academy or uh, talking heads in the press uh, don't express a belief that America is kind of standing on the edge of the cliff in regards to becoming a failed democracy. If, the, and a big if, but if this is true, where do you point the finger? Is it in the structure of the system or as Professor Kavanaugh just said, it's every, every little problem we have is all about operator error. Um, boy, <laughs> that's an impossible question to answer. <laughs> welcome to the, I think welcome it's, to the Prince of Publius. Yeah, holy cow. Yeah, so it, it's really a little bit of everything, right? I mean, because the system is what it is, and it has fabulous elements like free speech and all those great liberties that we have, which also then are problem creators, right? And so it is some of us, we have to learn how to temper our selfishness and our immediate impulses. We don't always do that well. And then the system is supposed to sort of, you know, Madisonian checks and balances and separations and all those things to protect us from ourselves, really, right? And, um, and so it's a combination. I, I like to embrace Meacham's Soul of America message, although it's, you know, it's pretty light history. Uh, it's, it's encouraging, right? We've been through some pretty, pretty bad times. And, you know, the system's held up. And we, you know, the Civil War, what more do you need to see other than that? And then, you know, January 6th, the insurrection, we're moving through that, uh, and certainly time will tell um, whether there's lasting damage. Uh, we'll need another couple of election cycles to see where we come out. But um, I don't think we're that far down the road of destruction. I think we've got a lot of potential, and, and, and it's not, the game's not over yet. Uh, but we do need to raise the, the dialogue and have these kind of conversations all over the country where people can really grapple with the nuance, because that's where it's at, right? It's a complexity. Professor Kavanaugh, thoughts? No, I, I agree. There is a lot of nuance and there is a lot of complexity. There is no doubt there is. Uh, but I do think that um, if I, I just think I wonder if the framers, if they were able to, you know, I hate to, you know, put them all in that one round peg kind of thing, because we 
uh, we know that we know better, but I'm going to do it anyway. If they would, if they would, be, if they would come back and and they would see how the system is running now, I'm just I'm just curious. Is like they're like, well, we gave you the tools to fix it. Why can't you fix it? If it if it, it ain't running right, take it into the shop and tune it up. You got the tools, but we refuse to do that because of various issues which are partly flaws in the system. And as Kevin said, flaws in ourselves. So, um, you know, I think there is a, there are a lot of nuances there to consider. Well, is, is the problem, and this is again, probably to all of you here, but is, is the problem that the, the national constitution, all right, reflecting uh, Professor Fox's commentary on their view of the people, so stifled popular expression and, as, and again we just commented on the difficulty of the amendment process uh, 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 and uh, the, the the stifle of democratic voices uh, through the electoral college is the problem that they they created so many guardrails to protect us protect us from excessive democracy that it has led to this pressure cooker about boiling over because the people do not have and it was i think you know mike mentioned it before the faith in government all right uh so it really is in some ways more of a structural thing uh, uh because of their desire in the 18th century to create these barriers guardrails whatever you want to 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 to, to stifle too much popular sovereignty anyone you know, there I, is it because that's where i kind of link is what we're seeing coming out of the people, which is what we saw in the 1850s, 60s, what we saw in the 1950s, 60s, uh, there that is a frustration that the system does not respond, all right, to the people at the national level. Yes, it can at state level. We're seeing that now. Sure. States are all over the place when we come to, you know, some states are doing something about climate change. Some states are going in the opposite direction, uh, gun violence, you know, uh, uh, reproductive rights there at the federal level, there might be ways to do that. But at the national level, uh, the frustration, the low, the, the low no numbers of faith in our system, as Mike was touching on, is, is a direct relationship to the design of that and not allowing enough popular will. Tim, you. Look yeah, I, uh, I can't help but think sometimes uh, time, our expectations about time matter. Uh, the, two of the most fascinating books I've read in the last 20 years, uh, I don't know whether they're right or not, but uh, Larry Kramer, and then I'm reading a book by Barry uh, Friedman right now, and they both are dealing with the court. I know it's shocking, David, I'm reading a book about the court, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I know every time I read a chapter, I feel a little dirty, but, um, but the thesis is if you, the, the court actually responds to the will of the people. And over, over like decades. Uh, now that's frustrating. Um, I, and I think Americans, we're getting less and less able to see things uh, like mega trends. Mm -hmm. What's the arc of, you know, this arc of history kind of notion. So I think, uh, I can't help but think that our frustration with, uh, you know, policy and uh, things aren't going the way, you know, it looks like the house is on fire. Uh, there's an argument to be made that we need to step back and consider multiple decades before we decide if is the system responsive or not. I mean, how long did it take us to get to 1965? Right, but we, as I listen to you, that, I that was a 40, that was, a, that was a 60 year movement to get to 1964, 65. So, uh, so, so the, 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 the unbelievable activities of, of the civil rights movement at a very grassroots level for a long period of time. Think about all the pro-life people when they when uh, January 22nd, 1973 occurs, and then we get Dobbs that last year. Think about how long that um, that process took for that policy achievement for those folks. So I think time, the time frame and our expectations of time may matter um, on this question. It's not satisfactory because we want stuff now. Well, I don't know if we, you know, yeah and no. While I listen to you, I, I think back to, uh, I think some of you had watched the uh, the documentary series Eyes on the Prize, 
And I think back to this interview with Thurgood Marshall talking about gradualism, that, you know, there were Southern moderates and stuff who wanted, you know, we, we again, let's, let's take it inch by inch, a gradual approach. And he said, you know, I believe in gradualism, but 90 odd years is gradual enough. And, and again, I, I, I think about, I think about climate challenges. All right. We were seriously warned, you know, at, at, at minimum in the late 1990s. And yet we've made we've made hardly any progress whatsoever. I look at gun violence. I mean, if we want to take uh, uh, you know uh, the Colorado shooting in 1999 as the beginning point, you know, uh, we we've in fact we could argue we've gone backwards uh, uh, on, on well, that. but I, I would push back on that and say you're you're cherry picking issues that are near and dear to you, and that may and those those issues are actually. Uh, you know, near and dear to me, it's, it's you and I share a lot of sympathies in terms of our, our policy outcome preferences. But uh, there are things that are going on that over a sustained multiple decade time frame, it takes for these policies to unfold for for the popular will to be to be seen. And again, we can fight about whether it's the popular will or not. I'm just saying the system is set up for progress. Ooh, there's another word I can't believe I said. <laughs> um, for progress to occur. I mean, it's just the nature of our system, but there's an argument to be made that it takes multiple decades for these things to occur. No, yes. no. <laughs> what? No. I have, no? I have, what, what year was this book about the court published? <laughs> uh, Kramer wrote his, uh, it's the people themselves. I want to say it's early 2000s. Um, in yeah, the, okay. Okay. I'll rest my case. <laughs> um, because no, I'm saying this, I, I'm saying this simply because if you look at the current court, back to my point earlier about you have a president that's not elected by the majority of the people. And now we have a court that is entrenched for life that clearly, uh, has, uh, I, I, I would almost say has gone off the rails because right. it, it, I was just reading a piece, uh, it, um, gosh, uh, just today, I think it was, um, about the reflections of policy in court decisions. And I would argue that you, we have a court that absolutely does not represent the popular will, nor is it supposed to. I understand for all the people listening, I understand their client is supposed to be the constitution, but they're also supposed to tell the truth when they are in front of the committee, when they're giving their testimony about settled law, about stare decisis, Right. So I think that I think that with the current court, because it is so hard for us, it's so it's not, not impossible, but it's very difficult for us to undo court decisions today because the legislative process is so ineffective, which would provide an avenue for us to actually reflect the popular will of the people. But it's not happening. Well, I, I, the only we could go on or on there, but this, but, but Chris, you know as well as anybody, there's a great book that makes the argument that the court does follow trends. Um, it's called the Hollow Hope. Yeah, mine. Yeah, um, and it it uh, it's an argument that it took you know a couple decades for uh, that the court was following popular sentiment on Roe. The court was following popular sentiment on desegregation. So, I mean, this this is a fundamentally uh, important question, which hopefully men of goodwill can differ on uh, how long point, it takes. That's, that's exactly my point, is the fact that this current court is actually not doing that now. They're moving backward on so many things in, in the realm of uh, expansion of specific certain rights. Um, so I would argue that uh, say court, yes, has a, a, at some point has been ahead of the public, public will, sometimes a little behind the public will, but never like flying in the face of the public will that we see with this current court. So Mike, Mike, Mike was going to, Mike is, Mike's making faces. Please Mike. I didn't say, sorry. Yeah, but I know you're, you're, you're on our time. I'll make this quick. I, I mean, I, I agree with this arc of history. Like I agree. Tim has us thinking about these bigger things. I think looking at policies is important. I'm looking even like bigger, right? Like starting with TR president Roosevelt, moving through the Great Depression, up through World War I, to the Civil Rights Movement, we had government that was ready and willing to act. Now, maybe not always as fast as we wanted, right? There was a belief that an active government could do good things. And 
we have generations of people who had examples of that, right? Like we are now in the shadow of this, um, of, of Reaganism, of this idea that government needs to be, not only needs to be smaller, it is smaller. Clinton, Obama. I, we might have lost Mike. I can't tell. Uh, he may bounce back uh, uh, here. Uh, but so I want to want to close, and if Mike comes back, we'll we'll let him do so. Um, but I guess you know one of the fundamental problems that that we deal with is if I guess if we're optimistic, uh, you know, you have to ask the question. How can people with good intentions on both sides of an issue work towards some type of resolution in a democratic republic? All right, which seems to be, you know, although I don't know if uh, if um, Hamilton's implying that people have good intentions uh, uh, there, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I guess given the state of our political culture, what are some suggested remedies? Is it social action slash protest? You know. Uh, is it, you know, increasing participation rates in voting, as Kevin has talked about, that they have been? What are some of the remedies uh, uh, to fix some of these problems in which that are causing, you know, uh, the high levels of frustration that the people have with the system? You know, and I, I hope that makes sense. So, Chris, any thoughts about, you know, uh, uh, is, uh, about what remedies what, what can we, the people, do, uh, uh, you know, to, to try to fix this system? Well, I have some thoughts, but this is a family show. So, um, <laughs> no, I, and I say that flippantly, but um, I do think there's there are things that could be done. Um, and I, But it, it's like, you know, back to Tim's comment about the sovereign citizens. We've come so far with the groups of people that you know they believe that all rights are absolute and there are no limits on those rights and in addition there are no responsibilities attached to those rights and i think kevin was alluding to that earlier about some of the things that you know we the people should be responsible for doing and that is you know so much of it comes back to education but not i know that's the easy answer especially civic education with the, the four guys i see on the screen with me here holy cow a gazillion years of civic education between the, the group of us. But um, I think the other thing is this, the ability to take a breath, right? Uh, for American society to take a breath and say, you know what? I'm going to let this person have his or her say. I want to listen to what they have to say. And then I'm going to weigh it against what I think of. And I keep thinking of uh, Judge Learned Hand and his spirit of liberty. You know, what's the spirit of liberty? It's the one that's not too sure that it's right. But I don't know that I, I don't know how we get back to that in in 2023 in the future to take a breath and, and, and listen to people with whom you might disagree and give them that space. Professor Moore. Yeah, um, Don Henley has a great line. Uh, how can love survive in such a graceless age? I think uh, I would insert how how can we survive in such a graceless age? I think, you know, our founders seem to be okay with a half a loaf. They seem to be okay with a half a loaf. In other words, uh, and I'm not sure uh, culture, I, I guess I'm speaking culturally now. Uh, I'm not sure we like getting a half a loaf. We want the whole loaf. And I, and I, and I want your loaf too, by the way. Uh, so in policy, I, I think we've done a lousy job of explaining that you're, you're going to get a half a loaf and isn't that great? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I think if there's any hope for us to recover from this uh, uh, silly malaise that we're in, uh, this, this fundamentalist approach to wanting everything your way on the right and the left, uh, I think it's if, if we can accept the fact that we're going to get a half a loaf and that's great. Uh, Professor uh, Williams uh, suggested remedies of, of if indeed uh, frustration with government, uh, you know, and therefore the tapping down of the, you know, possible popular sovereignty or the popular will, what remedies might you suggest? 
Uh, you're Good. muted. Thank you. Um, I think I think individuals who um, have some of the qualities that Tim just discussed, who are willing to accept, I think you said half a loaf. Um, the remedy is is they should be running for office. I think we need different types of people running for office. We need those types of people serving in government. I think I think. We get those people in the system helping operate it. I think we'll see some of these changes. And Professor Fox. Well, I don't have any prescription other than I really can't wait to hear what the kids across the country have to say for this last bullet, right? When we get to national, <laughs> um, because I'm really, I'm really curious from the minds of 17, 18 year olds, like, okay, yeah. how are they viewing this? Cause they're the future and we're a bunch of old guys. So I'm intrigued by that. Second, uh, I think, one thing, and it's kind of trite, but it's, we all have to learn how to listen. And what I mean by that is there's some quippy phrases and like active listening jargon, but it's like we need to learn how to listen to understand rather than listen to respond. And that's what we hear now. It's like nobody actually listens to what anyone else is saying. They're just like prepping their next, you know, hot spot remark back to be who's the quickest and most glib. Um, and we're all and we're losing the dialogue. Right. Because if we want to get I'm to sorry, a world. Would you, would, I'm sorry, Kevin, what'd you say? <laughs> yeah get turn up your hearing aid there Kevin. Uh, so you know uh it, it's it's a challenge right we got to get to the point where we can uh we can get along because if we're going to get to the half a loaf world which is about compromise right we got to be able to hear each other fully and then the other thing is maybe some uh, campaign finance reform in the wake of citizens united it is devastating what that money uh has been doing to our political system yeah. yeah. So a, a few things to wrap us up first. I, I think I'm with Kavanaugh. I want to push for a national holiday, a take a breath holiday, although it'll just turn another excuse to blow things up and uh, and drink a lot of alcohol, uh, you know, uh, kind of where's stuff. The, where's but, the problem? Huh? <laughs> where's the Not problem? Not in that order. Not in that I order. Guess, <laughs> I, I, guess, yeah, I guess I was thinking more of a reflection meditation day, but maybe you were thinking about another 4th of July uh, kind of uh, experience uh, there. Um, I, you know, I, I, I do believe that, that the change really has to come at the state level. I think that some of the things you guys have said can be accomplished at the state level. And if you change, and especially Mike, I think states do have the, the ability to change elections. And, and change how elections are done and that, the, the, you know, if there's active movement for changes across the nation is to really try to bring about more effective elections, i.e. expanding, all right, the process, ranked voting election, uh, getting more, you know, groups, parties, whatever you want to call them, into the process so there's a broader sense of, of voices uh, being heard. And the last thing is just a general commentary on popular sovereignty and this notion of the people. Uh, uh, you know, I love it when politicians talk about, I've heard the voice of the people. And you just want to say, well, who are the people? I mean, when, we, when, when politics, well, who are the people when we use that language in this country? And lastly, the American people are about as fickle as you can get. I mean, I, I, just, I think about two things. I think about gay rights. And we're all old enough to have gone through that and, and viewed or either participated in that journey. It just look how quickly, all right, attitudes change. And we, you know, there's there's three of us here from California, especially in California, 60% vote to deny gay marriage. And within 10 years, suddenly 65% support gay marriage. Uh, uh, in that sense, we can, uh, like I said, look at a, a number of other issues in which I, I just don't know if the, the people themselves know what they want. Half a loaf, three quarters of a loaf, one loaf, or not only one loaf, but they want Tim's loaf too. Uh, <laughs> there, do they even know what they want uh, kind of stuff? And I think kids need to uh, consider that. Well, this was, again, as I said, a topic that kind of kept me up, didn't know what direction. Uh, I do believe it was uh, lively. I hope we have provided uh, you students and teachers, you know, some tangible things uh, to run with and to some uh, uh, you know, ideas to uh, contemplate. 
Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, Professor Fox, it's been a, a great uh, joy to have you uh, join with us. We're, you know, as the fifth Beatle, uh, uh, one would say, and uh, we look forward to hopefully having you uh, back again here on uh, the program. Uh, in the next episode, we're going to continue kind of this theme and another from another perspective on small d democracy by looking at unicameral and bicameral uh, ism and the, the, I guess the debate over that. Until then, peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye bye, bye bots. <laughs>